please check your smartphone or other sound emitting device to make sure it will not emit any sound. Mike Dalton, third. Carol Galato, sixth. Nate Stevens, second. Gina Walkowitz, fourth. Sam Weeder, first. So Carol's technically Madam Chief Judge, have all of the judges' timers, ballot counters been briefed? 
Final clock test chair, all of the judges, timers, and counters have been briefed. And the sergeant of arms. And the sergeant of arms. Yes. So with that, let's begin the humorous speech contest. Sam Weeder, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. Sam Weeder. Did you ever hear the saying, you are what you eat? There's a lot of truth in that. I once knew a couple, a man and a woman, they were meeting for the first time. Their eyes met, it was love at first sight. They knew in each other they had found a soulmate. And yet, for some reason, they were unable to run away and get married. Obviously, they ate too much cantaloupe. <laughs> if you've had trouble processing that one, Charlie, you're obviously not eating enough processed food. <laughs> well, I found throughout my life, again and again, that I was what I ate. When I first entered, junior high school, I had my first experience of cafeteria food. That variety of culinary curiosities that was dolloped onto a plastic tray. And with each meal, we would get a bread and butter sandwich. Now, this meal wasn't satisfying to me at all, so I ate my bread, and I ate the bread of anyone else who would give it to me. <laughs> the following summer, my father took a movie of me getting out of a swimming pool. When I saw that movie later, I was shocked by what I saw. Somehow, I had turned into the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> I had looked at my abdomen, I had this impressive looking six pack. <clears throat> of course, it was a six pack of hamburger rolls. <laughs> <sighs> I was what I ate. Well, I got out of that, I was shocked into doing something different. I got more active, started running, joined the cross country team. And in cross country, we learned about a new eating concept for runners called carbohydrate loading. Now the way this works is you eat a lot of carbohydrates the day before the race, you have lots of energy to run when the time comes to run. Well, our team ate a lot of spaghetti to do this. And wouldn't you know, before long, everyone on the team looked like a thin, tall stalk of spaghetti with legs. <laughs> like we were so thin, we had to run around in the shower just to get wet. <laughs> Well, many years after that, I had a job as a marketing writer. I would sit behind the computer for hour after hour each day, staring at the computer. By mid-afternoon, my brain would slow down. By the end of the day, I was like moving in slow motion, dragging myself out of the office. And this went on day after day until finally, I felt like Tom Cruise in the movie Top Gun. I had the need. The need for speed. So I thought, what I need to do, I need to eat more fast food. <laughs> Going too slow, I've got to pick it up here. So that's what I started doing. I went home, and I prepared a, didn't really prepare, I found a, in my freezer a budget gourmet sweet and sour chicken frozen dinner in a cardboard microwaveable box. Popped it into my microwave, put the setting on warp speed with the phasers on stun. And in a few minutes, I pulled out a meal that was zapped to perfection. <laughs> Other nights, I used my wondrous culinary skills I developed over the years. An amazing skill called boiling. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how many things you can cook just by knowing how to boil water. My favorite thing was this Freezer Queen Chicken a la King dinner that came in a plastic pouch. <laughs> now, what you did, you boiled the pot of water, then drop the pouch into the water, wait a few minutes, pour the water off, cut the bag open, and pour the contents over a piece of toast. 
<laughs> and there it was, a taste-tempting culinary creation that looked like, kind of like the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius on a plate. I could tell you're salivating just thinking about it. <laughs> Other nights, I'd also use my boiling skills to make the Kraft Instant Macaroni and Cheese dinner. Once again, boiling water, dumping the macaroni until it's soft, pour off the water, and then I would add this magical yellow powder that came in this small foil pack. You just sprinkle it on there, mix it up, and I had a macaroni and cheese dinner. It was wonderful. And here's something you might not have realized about these dinners. They were designed to be eaten fast. I mean, the whole consistency of this macaroni and cheese totally lacked anything resembling to cheese, and so it just slid right down your throat. <laughs> and the concoction was so tasteless that I ate it as quickly as I could just to get it out of my mouth. So it was fast food, take it to the next degree. Well, this is the way I ate for many years, until one day, I thought, I'm still feeling zapped myself. I'm still feeling run down. I'm eating all this fast food. It's just not working. What's the matter? Lucky for me, I happened to start dating a wonderful woman named Jacqueline, who was a chiropractic nutritionist. I said, Jacqueline, what am I doing wrong? I'm eating fast food. I'm as slow as ever. She said, well, let me take a look at your diet for a minute and see what you're eating. OK, you've got this budget gourmet uh, microwave dinner. By the time you pull it out of that microwave oven, there's more nutrition in the box than in the food. And certainly more fiber. And what about that freezer queen chicken alakeen dinner in those plastic bags you're dropping in there? Do you realize that the plastic from that bag is leaching into your food along with other chemicals? It's just lining your stomach. It's turning your stomach into like a garbage bag of liner, which is perfect for the way you're eating anyway, so who knows? And what about those macro, what about the, uh, what about the, uh, back, okay, what's next on the menu here, folks? Help me out. Macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Macaroni and cheese. <laughs> what about that? That magical powder that you're sprinkling on the macaroni and cheese, do you know that that contains 14 different chemical additives? It's magical, all right. It's transforming you from a prince into a frog. <laughs> She said, well, I've dated a lot of animals in the past, but I'm not dating a frog, so you better change your diet. Well, I got the message loud and clear from Jacqueline. I needed to make some changes. And the big lesson I learned from her is that you really are what you eat. If you eat a lot of slow-cooked, highly processed, lifeless food, you will become lifeless as well. Now, I know we're all Toastmasters here, but I have to tell you, as a former Pillsbury Doughboy, you're probably eating way too much toast. <laughs> I'm conscious here. Time. Nate Stevens, Father Knows Best, Father Knows Best, Nate Stevens. How many times has a parent told a child something like this? Those dishes aren't going to wash themselves. Worse off, they say this. 
Money doesn't grow on trees. Or how about this one? This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Uh, yes, fellow Toastmasters, guests, most definitely Madam Contest Chair. I have no idea because my parents never said normal things like that and said they said weird things, things like this. There's no good eye doctors in Pittsburgh. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I'm still not sure, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Before I do, I need to tell you three important facts about my family. The first one is, we all wear glasses. Secondly, we drove around in a Volkswagen Bug, painted bright orange. <laughs> Lastly, and most importantly, my father had a comb over. <laughs> you can picture us now. Without fail, the hottest day of summer, we would cram into that little car, we would drive all the way across the state of Pennsylvania, all 300 miles, because there's no good eye doctors in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I have no idea how we even fit in there. It was a miserable experience. When I grew up, the speed limit was 55. Can you imagine that? As slow as that sounds, it was too fast for that car to muster. <laughs> Everything would fly by us, except a few cars would slow down. You'd feel these eyes peering in. <laughs> what kind of freaks would drive a car like that? And then speed off. Uh, if there was just something to do in that car. Sure, there was a radio, but even if you cranked it up full volume, you couldn't hear it over the engine. <laughs> My sister sat next to me, but she wanted nothing to do with me. Instead, she was always reading a book in Latin. She wanted to be scholarly. I couldn't talk to her. I couldn't play games with her. I couldn't even look at her without her freaking out, saying, Hey, he's bothering me! <laughs> My parents would turn around and say, oh, would you stop it? Why don't you be more like your sister and read a book in Latin? <laughs> For some reason, I forgot my Latin books. <laughs> now then, I told you an important fact about my family. My dad had a comb over. Not like mine, but sort of. This was important for two reasons. The first one, it was embarrassing for all of us and this man and his sideways growing hair. But worst off, he was absolutely convinced that if the car windows were open just a smidgen, that would be enough to create this huge vortex and mess his hair up. Mess your day up as well. Now then, if you put two and two together, you now realize we're driving across the state of Pennsylvania with the windows all the way up without any air conditioning on the hottest day of summer because there's no good eye doctors in Pittsburgh. <laughs> It's no wonder my family didn't go on many vacations. However, they assumed this was a good vacation. We'd always go to some place, a national landmark, something like the Liberty Bell, and there we'd look at it. It's this wonderful, magnificent bell. My sister would say, Did you know that Libertas is Latin for liberty? My parents would be amazed. Oh, yes, you're so wonderful. I'd be sickened by that. I'd say, Well, did you know that the Liberty Bell Pennsylvania's first crack. <laughs> My parents would smack me. Oh, why don't you be more like your sister and have more respect for Pennsylvania history? <laughs> that night, we stayed in a motel. A motel worthy of being in a Hitchcock movie. Inside our room, there were three beds. Two normal ones and a cot. Without fail, I always got the lumpy cot. That thing that has all these spikes that go up your spine. Anytime I moved around, it would squeak. <clears throat> Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. The next day, we piled back into the car and we head over to get our eyes examined. I'm sure you've all had your eyes examined, maybe not in Philadelphia. It was the same as any other eye doctor. You go in there and he's asking, is this better at one or two? One or two? While he was doing that, I didn't know how he's asked my sister. Is he going to ask her in Roman numerals? Is it better I or I I? <laughs> Another thing my dad always told us is Philadelphia is at the forefront of fashion and design. I have no idea where he came up with this. <laughs> he was convinced it was true. I was convinced the absolute opposite was true because without fail, my eye doctor would give me a choice of miserable-looking glasses. 
glasses that were guaranteed to get you ridiculed in school. <laughs> However, this one year, my eye doctor pulled out these trendy frames. These frames I brought with me today. It's even so nice, I'm gonna wear these for you. And I was just so excited to wear these because I, I was fashionable and, and everything was just so clear. And I just had this intense urge to read everything in front of me, even Latin books. <sighs> now then, after we all had our eyes examined, we pile back into the car and head back to Pittsburgh, not stopping this time. There I get home, my friends would see me and they'd say, Oh, Nate, we missed you. Did you do anything fun for your vacation? And I'd say, Ha, yes I did. Matter of fact, I brought back a souvenir. These fine glasses. Because there's no good eye doctors in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Madam Constantine. <laughs> Time. Thank you. Mike Dalton, the confirmed bachelor, and his seven female co workers. The confirmed bachelor and his seven <coughs> female co workers, Mike Dalton. Why a confirmed bachelor? Three reasons. I want the money, I want to be the boss, and I don't share dessert. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, lovely ladies, husbands and my fellow bachelors, before I began working with my seven ladies, I was in a group with six other guys and just one lady. Life was simple and easy. For instance, who's the best looking? Cheryl. Who's the nicest? Cheryl. Who's the best dressed? Cheryl. <laughs> then my life changed and it became complicated and dangerous. <laughs> who's the best looking? You can't ask a question like that with seven ladies around. Someone will get hurt. But you can ask, hey, who's, all, who's the lucky dork with all the chicks? Mike. <laughs> <laughs> who's the cute curmudgeon? Mike. <laughs> and who's the best dressed? Well, on a Saturday morning, I may be giving the ladies a run for their money. <laughs> so let's look at some adventures I've had with my seven ladies. One time we had to drive to Akron for a meeting. I got charmed into being the driver. Do you have any idea how much luggage seven women need for a drive? <laughs> took all my engineering skills. <laughs> there wasn't room left for one more tube of lipstick. <laughs> On the road, 
the ladies started talking about what they'd wear for the Christmas party that evening. And I was okay with blouses, sweaters, pants, necklaces, bracelets, makeup, rings, mascara, eyeshadow, and lipstick. But then Sandy stepped over the line. <laughs> she wanted to talk about shoes. <laughs> shoes! I explained to my ladies, we have one rule in this van, ladies, no talking about shoes. If I get seven ladies talking about shoes, we may never move to another topic. <laughs> I could drive off a bridge muttering about pumps, stilettos, and Louis Vuitton. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move to the next adventure. Gail announced that her daughter would be married in August. Then Debbie announced that her daughter would be married in September. So it became the summer of wedding. One of the things I learned was the favorite topic for my seven ladies is weddings. And by definition, the least favorite topic for a confirmed bachelor is <laughs> weddings. <laughs> for months, I heard a stereophonic discussion of every detail about a wedding. I developed a rash. <laughs> and I also figured out how long the planning for these weddings has been going on. If you go way back to the ultrasound, when the technician said, congratulations, Mrs. Buckner, you're going to have a little girl. Mama immediately thought, she'll be married in my church. We'll have the reception at the club in the Algonquin room and she'll wear my grandmother's dress. Now let's move to my final adventure with the ladies. One morning at eight o'clock, I opened the door to the office and there she was, Janet. Shoulder length, blonde hair, she had She had a fit physique. <laughs> she was flashing me a million dollar smile. She had her arms up and she goes, Mike. Someone was happy to see me. <laughs> then she sweetened her voice. She said, I have a stink bug on my desk. Could you get rid of it? <laughs> I'm treated like I'm George Clooney for a stink bug? <laughs> Let me clue you in. For those of us less handsome than George, it doesn't take that much charm to get rid of a stink bug. <laughs> now let's look at the final question then. Have my seven ladies convinced me to give up bachelorism? No. Three reasons. All those shoes, planning for a wedding, and, well, Janet's already taken. Madam Chair. <laughs>
ton. Jana Walkowitz, don't make me pull this car over. Don't make me pull this car over. Jana Walkowitz. children, you are bound to hear these types of expressions and experience moments that will make you laugh for a lifetime. I'm going to share three traveling experiences with you, and I want you to ask yourself, would you pull the car over? <laughs> would you reprimand your child in any way? Or would you just plain give up? <laughs> My son, daughter, husband, and I are on an eight-hour trip to Virginia Beach. After the fourth encounter with stopped traffic, my daughter is crying because we've already been in the car for eight hours. And of course, she's already asked how much longer, and I have to give her specifics. So we have four hours left to go. I finally looked at my husband, because my son's got to eat for the fourth time already. He's three months old, and he's still not bottle fed. I said, pull this car over, get off this exit right now, get a hotel room, or I'm, I'm afraid that Madison will never step in the car again. So we pulled over to a hotel room. I was proud of myself because overall, I kept my cool, used some serious breathing techniques throughout that entire trip, <laughs> almost hyperventilating, <laughs> and didn't lose my mind. Now, we did pull over, but to a better place. Now, the next traveling experience was another long trip. We did get in the car, surprisingly, to go on this trip, to go to the airport. I thought, with a five-month-old and five-year-old, even without my husband, we could probably do a lot better than we did on that car ride, right? <laughs> of course, I had forgotten about the airtight capsules, the small spaces, and changing diapers with surprises in them. <laughs> and I might have to say, it really surprises me that the airlines actually expect you to change diapers in those little itty bitty tiny restrooms on the plane. I can barely fit in there myself. I am so glad that my daughter was sitting next to me on that plane because if anyone else had been sitting on that plane, they might not have ever flown again. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, what's John doing? Shh. He's doing it. He's doing what? Shh. Oh, brother. <laughs> <sighs> I can feel every glare and every disapproving passenger that moment in that airtight capsule. What do I do? Oh goodness. Okay. Slowly, I push the call button, which I've never done before in my life. I tell you, no matter how many times I might do that interpersonal <coughs> advanced speaking manual, nothing can prepare me for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I need a trash bag. A big one. And my baby's diaper. Please. My daughter's shaking her head in embarrassment. And as I know these passengers have no clue what's about to hit them in this airtight capsule. <laughs> I kneel over in the seat next to my daughter. And I start changing the diaper. Sorry, excuse me. I go fast again. <gasps> I get the diaper in the trash bag and I sit down this tied shut. disgruntled eyeball staring at me in that bag. 
I actually hit a guy in the head. <laughs> With my son's foot. Of course. <laughs> Finally, I'm back in my seat. The deed is done. I felt like the worst was behind me. Literally. I was so proud of myself. In that moment, I had not reprimanded my daughter, no matter that she didn't help me at all on the plane. The next traveling experience I'll tell you about was in that same flight. You see, earlier that morning, my flight had been delayed due to rest requirements. I'm never surprised what happens at the Philly airport, that's for sure. So I knew as soon as we departed the plane that we would have to quickly make our way to the gate so we wouldn't miss our flight. Oh, oh my goodness, we have to quickly make it. Let's go, Madison. Let's go. So we get there. And there. time. guests, I'll never go to Niagara Falls again. <laughs> Many years ago, I decided to take my children, two daughters, to a trip and see Canada, to see Niagara Falls. Now, my mother doesn't like to travel, hates to travel, but my children, being the young children that they are, 
went up to their grandmother and said, we're going to Niagara Falls, Graham, would you like to go with us? And of course she said, yes, to my chagrin. I had not planned on a third party, especially my mother. My mother is one who is perfectly dressed no matter what time of day. She is perfectly cocked with her hair. My children, on the other hand, were going for a party. We were going for fun, so we can unpack wonderful clothes. We got in the car that morning. First thing my mother said was, Carol, did you pack the right clothes? Mm -hmm. Yes, was my response, because I did. traveling a little bit further and she's making me so nervous that we missed the turn off and it took us five hours to even hit Buffalo. <laughs> not a good sign. Not a good sign for this trip. My mother was a navigator. This was supposed to be a help. It wasn't. When I'd ask her, where are we? She'd say, we're on that road, and the sign says 55. I said, Mom, we're not on Route 55. No, 55 mile an hour. That's no help. <laughs> we finally made it to Canada. We crossed that bridge into a foreign country. What happens? We can't get on the road that we're supposed to get on. Why? It's not on the map. Uh, my mother says it's not on the map. Do I pull the car over? That was my comment. How? Where? It's a highway. I had no idea where I was at. We hit a wrong road. We took an exit. We pulled into a driveway of a gentleman who was underneath the hood of a tractor trailer. Now, if anybody knows what the roads are, a tractor trailer, Somebody who drives a truck would know, I would hope. So I pull into his driveway, and he's very friendly. And thank goodness he spoke English. <laughs> but he didn't speak my mother's English. <laughs> I asked her to go out and ask the gentleman how to get on Queen Anne's Highway. So she goes up to this gentleman, and she explains that she's from Altoona, Pennsylvania, and it's already taken us 10 hours on a five-hour trip. <laughs> and we just want to stop somewhere. And the man said, I know where Altoona, Pennsylvania is. And my mother gets back in the car and says, let's just follow him home. I'm like, no, Mom, we haven't seen the falls yet. <laughs> well, okay then, so we get back in the car, he had given her a piece of paper. This is how, this is how you get out of here and on that highway. Well, between the time he gave it to her and she gave it to me, she had turned it upside down. <laughs> so now we were headed in the opposite direction. And 30 minutes later, we were back in their driveway. <laughs> the poor man said, oh my God, they're back. How is this possible? This time I got out of the car and he said, and I showed him the directions. He said, oh no, honey, this way. I was like, I should have done that in the first place. We landed in our hotel. Now mind you, we were only planning on three people. Now we have four. So arrangements were a little bit different. My children opened their suitcase and my mother went aghast. Oh my God, you didn't bring those clothes, did you? Like, yes, this is what my children are going to wear. Well, what if you run into somebody you know? <laughs> Mom, we are technically 10 hours from home. How am I going to run into somebody I know? So we parked the car that evening. We're walking towards the falls. And then this year, my mother said, I can't believe those children are wearing those clothes. I can't believe those children are wearing those clothes. What do you think you're doing? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? I said, Mom, we're not going to see anybody we know. We're walking down, and I hear, Carol, <laughs> Carol. And I look around. It's got to be other Carols in Canada, right? They're, they're not talking to me. Carol, why don't you just stop? I turned around, and here's my beloved insurance man and his entire family. And here's my mother 
are going, I told you you should have worn better clothes. <laughs> now I'm going to be too embarrassed to go to the insurance company. I said, it is what it is, dear mother. That was two days worth of travel. We ended up coming home in the dark of the night in a big fog. The weather had changed so dramatically from the time we left in Canada till we got to Clearfield. The fog was so deep that I was afraid to pull over, but I needed to get off the road. And there was headlights behind me, and it was beautiful. There was a somebody who was going to help us. And this man got out of the car and said, where are you headed? I said, Altoona, Pennsylvania. He said, well, honey, you're closer to Kerbinsville. And my mother goes, my sister lives in Kerbinsville. We'll go to her house. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I said, OK, Mom, that's what we'll do. We get into Clearfield, follow from Kerbinsville, following this little man. And we knock on my aunt's door. They think we're burglars. <laughs> what house do you think? We get rested, we're all laying on the floor. The next morning I wake up, my mother's on the couch and she's like this. We killed her. We know we killed her. Oh, what a trip. Everyone could remain silent until all the judges complete their ballots.